this week on Our Thing. And it was literally because he was on a roof across the street with a freaking rifle looking down into my bay window in my living room where we were sitting. AJ Anthony pours us a cocktail of mob style mayhem and murder. He was a really, really sharp guy, great storyteller. And I'm not supposed to like a guy who was a killer and a ruthless mobster, but I did. And Sandra Petty recounts her personal encounter with one of the most famous gangsters of our age. Stay tuned for the most entertaining hour in radio. This is our thing with everyone's favorite ex gangster, Gunner, 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 Gunner. Gunner. What's up? Welcome back to Our Thing on 1010 The King. I am joined by my tenured co-host, Bill Crooks from Partners in Crime Podcast. Hello. So we have a special episode, Christmas, or close to it anyways. Growing up in my home, life was very different, I think, from most people's uh, experiences. When I was like five or six years old, some girl said she could invite me to her birthday party because I was in the mafia, which I didn't even know what that was. Of course, this is my family name rang bells with the mafia. And so obviously there was some connection. Her mother said, oh, I don't want that kid. He's in the mafia. But I asked my uncle, I said, what the hell is the mafia? And he still laughs at me because he was only like 17 years old at the time. You know, so he's a kid himself. And he said, who told you that? And he's laughing. He said with his buddy and they're like, yeah, you'll figure it out one day. It's our family. Every Christmas throughout the day over like a two, three day period, including New Year's too, there would be Cadillacs and Lincolns pulling up all day. They pull up and they get out. The men look just like they were straight out of central casting. If you looked up mobster in the dictionary, that's what they looked like. So there's like older gentlemen, balding, slicked hair, suits on. They get out and they carry in a couple of bags of gifts or boxes of whatever. And they come in and go, hey, everybody, P, Gracie, and say hi to us, me and my sister. But all day on Christmas, there might be anywhere from 10 or 20 people would come and go, come and go. So they come in, they'd sit down, they'd speak in Sicilian at the table. They'd have vignolata, which is an Italian kind of cookie. This was a normal thing to have mobsters coming and going from my house all day. But for whatever reason, Christmas was especially festive. And I couldn't believe how many people would want to come see my grandparents on Christmas Day. Of all the places you could be on Christmas Day, you would come over to our house just to sit down and have coffee for an hour or whatever. But I guess that's just kind of the, the nature of the beast. I think that's the, the way old Sicilians are. Doesn't necessarily mean mobsters, but a lot of them were. Yeah, because even at my grandparents' house, that's what I remember is everybody came. Everybody came, right. And so you have a big family dinner, and then the men would go in the back room and smoke cigars and watch football. Obviously, it was Christmas, so college football was a big deal. Most of them were bookies or involved in sports betting, loan sharking, and God knows what. I was a kid, so I didn't really know. And I always think back, the strange irony is like the women didn't really know anything about it. My grandfather would speak in Sicilian, but he wouldn't talk openly on the phone with my grandmother or mother in the room or whatever. When he did most of his talking business would be when he would leave and he would go to meet them at their businesses or their homes or go wherever. I, oftentimes I would drive him when I got older because his eyes were going bad. So he had me drive him around. But the problem is I couldn't pick up on what they were talking about because they were speaking in Sicilian. So I might drive him to his Gumbadi's business, like a used car lot or a grocery store or whatever it was. And I'd walk in and I'd say, hey, Paul, how you doing? You know, old man, Paul. And then boom, they'd jump right into a conversation in Sicilian for 10 minutes. And God only knows what they're saying. And I'm sure that the FBI had translators to a degree, although that their particular dialect of Sicilian was very unique. They never openly talked business in English that I ever saw them, you know, and the, you know, the old mobsters that would come over to the house, they would sit at the table and have a cup of coffee and talk. They'd speak in English and they'd talk gossip and they'd talk about family business and they would talk about, you know, who's doing what and whose kids are doing what, whatever. But the second they wanted to go into some like diabolical dark stuff, bang, right into Sicilian. And nobody knew what they were saying unless you spoke Sicilian. And they wouldn't speak around the women. Tell. So in hindsight, I think back to all the Christmases as a young child. I will say this. Christmas was always festive. Right. Who, who, who? Oh, wise guy, eh? Well, and you know what that means. Street Beats with Bill Crooks and Partners in Crime Podcast. We are now going to dive into the latest news in the underworld happenings. Bill, what do you got for Street Beats? Okay, let's talk about Tijuana. It is famous for a eh, decadent sort of fun. 
Lately, it's also famous for homicides. The most homicides in Mexico, in fact, by at least double that of any other Mexican state. With a population of 2.1 million people, it sees around 2,000 murders annually. What? That's a lot of corpses. It's not surprising that Tijuana also sees its share of criminal activity like, say, theft. This particular story revolves around theft and a cartel, of course. But here's the twist. It was the cartel who got ripped off. According to prosecutors, in mid-November, a half dozen local and state police officers in Tijuana allegedly hatched a plot to steal a large shipment of drugs from a warehouse where traffickers were storing it. The Associated Press reports that the cache of drugs appeared to have belonged to the Sinaloa cartel, but they're cops, so it's okay, right? Wrong. Apparently, the cartel knew almost immediately who had pulled off the heist, and on November 18th, just hours after the theft, they sent gunmen to spray the federal prosecutor's office in Tijuana with at least 30 rounds, Swiss cheesing the building's facade. Within an hour, one of the municipal police officers allegedly involved in the heist was gunned down in the street. Six days later, gunmen targeted the state prosecutor's office with a barrage of gunfire. Nobody was injured. But the day after that, a state detective under investigation for the theft was gunned down in his car at a station in Tijuana. The attackers fled on a motorcycle. An employee of the state prosecutor's office on condition of anonymity confirmed this week that the two officers under investigation in the scandal had been shot and killed in broad daylight on the city streets in an apparent gangland revenge. A former police chief is on record claiming at least three other police officers have been killed since the heist, implying that the cartel may be executing a broad-based retribution for the theft. Kind of a better safe than sorry approach. Tijuana has long been a cesspool of corruption, but police stealing a cartel's whole drug shipment is being called a new low. And this town, that is saying wow. a lot. That is your street beat. Wow. Uh, these guys, you got to be pretty damn brazen to try and rob the cartel. And the thing is, you got to sell it to somebody. And somebody's going to be on the lookout for it because it just got ripped off. They often mark those kilos, too, like a stamp. So there could be like a scorpion on there or an apple or whatever, right? So all of a sudden, three hours after they robbed them, somebody goes, man, somebody just tried to sell me freaking 10 kilos with a scorpion on it for, for 10 grand under the going rate. Huh. And they're like, well, there's a reward for anyone leading information. And it just boom, 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 boom. It goes right back to these dumb cops. And, and they don't mess around. Think about that. 2,000 murders in one year. It's crazy, man. Yeah, to put it in perspective, it's about the size of Houston, which would see about 400 to 450 murders. So you're talking almost five times as many murders as anything in America that would be of a comparable size. Go figure. There's your street beats. Okay, there we have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll have our first guest of the night. So stay tuned to our thing on 1010 The King. We'll be right back. Hey, have you checked out Our Thing Apparel? It's the original gangster clothing brand that lets you represent where you live, featuring t shirts, hoodies, vintage tracksuits, and more. Our Thing Apparel allows you to customize your clothing for your city or state. And now we're proud to launch our Atlanta line of urban casual wear. Check out OurThingApparel.com and use the promo code 1010 when checking out to get 10% off your total order. Make our thing your thing. Has someone in your family lost a job recently and now you can't afford your mortgage payment? Or do you have a rental property and your tenants aren't paying you? We can come to the rescue and pay you cash for your home immediately. Yes, sell your home and get cash all over the phone without dealing with real estate agents or having to waste time showing your home to lukewarm buyers. You don't need to lose your house to foreclosure. If you have equity in your home, we'll buy your home and give you cash within days, all in a simple over the phone and virtual process. Call now before your situation gets worse. Sell a home you can't afford or just need anymore and get the cash you need today. Call this number now. 800-950-3143. 800-950-3143. That's 800-950-3143. Paid for by Want to Sell. What's up? Welcome back to our thing on 1010 The King. I'd like to welcome to the show my first guest of the night, AJ Anthony, author of a really interesting book, 
I've been having conversations with this guy for a while. I'm excited to have him on. AJ, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, man. So listen, you know, reading about the synopsis of your book, every time I read it, I thought of Bill because Bill lived in Florida and he was like always at bars, hanging out at the bars and beach bars and all this stuff. And Working bars, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so you were a bartender, but uh, out in California. Yeah. And Bay Area. Bay Area. So, I mean, I can only imagine the stuff that you saw and heard or experienced as a bartender out there over the years. It's a great concept for a book. Bartenders are kind of almost like therapists. There's so much, they're almost like a, a barber, you know. But tell us a little about you, where you're from originally and your kind of career path and what led you to become a bartender and ultimately what led you to write this book. Well, I, I grew up in the Bay Area in a small island town called Alameda. My dad passed away when I was nine. My mom had to work two jobs. So I pretty much raised myself. I was a normal kid. Other than that, I played sports outdoors every day after school until it got dark. I started writing by just taking vocabulary, homework, and using all the words to create stories. And then I did that with top 100 song lists. So I started writing then and then more short stories, a lot of science fiction stuff when I was a teenager. So you've always been a writer. Yeah, I have, actually. I mean, there wasn't a lot of time once I got to college because, you know, college work, who wants to write more, you know? Yeah. So at some point, you decided to become a bartender, and I imagine this kind of changed the course of your life. I got to interject. Nobody decides to become a bartender. It's some <laughs> shit that happens to us. You know what? I buzzed through college, got my accounting degree in three years. And then, oh, yeah, you know, my mom was pushing it all the way for me to get through school and become an accountant. And I get to the end, and I'm going... I can't sit in an office all day. This is not me. So I decided to sit behind a bar all day or stand yeah. behind a bar all day. <laughs> and there's good money in it. There is. And of course, you know, all the tail and stuff that comes with it. <laughs> there's so, a yeah, stigma I mean, to being a bartender. Bartenders can make some serious bank. I had a friend of mine back in Detroit. He was the world champion bartender. Bottle flipping. You know, the. Oh, yeah. You told me about that. Yeah. So he, yeah. Won, he literally won the world championship. I could not believe it. But he would make, on average, eight or nine hundred dollars a night as yep. a bartender i mean that was a lot of freaking money that's because he's like tom cruise <laughs> yeah exactly well exactly. the thing is with that we did all that too when you there's 800 people in your bar you can't be flipping bottles around they want their damn drinks they don't want you to, yeah yeah you yeah, know yeah. there's a little bit of show okay here and there but people need to get their drinks they don't yeah. want to they would pause like like for twice a night. They would do this like routine to goodness gracious, great balls of fire, and they blow, blow the, the fire out. <laughs> but he was like, as he's pouring, he's always flipping and catching behind his back. Yeah. I knew from watching him that he made a ton of money. Hey, I got to be yeah. honest. It was a lot of fun for a few years. I mean, it gets to be a drag at the end and you get caught up in the partying. You don't even get off work till two or three. And then you go to a restaurant till like four or five. And then you go to somebody's house and party till nine or 10 in the morning. And then you have to start it all over again the next day. That is exactly my life yep. for about a decade. And it's like, oh man, there's a point where you just got to end it. I don't miss it at all now, but, you know, when I was in the middle of it, it was a blast. What was the funnest part about it? Like, what did you enjoy the most? Well, the club that the book's based on, we would do those skits on the bar top and go and dance, do the routines on the floor. So everything would stop. We'd all leave the bartenders and the waitresses and go do these routines on the dance floor. And everybody yeah. would just huddle around, you know, the, the guests. And they love it. I mean, they ate it up. Or we would yeah. do routines on the bar top. So that was a blast. It's a nice break and you're just having fun and dancing yeah. and playing and don't have to worry about making drinks for a while. That's when me and Gunner would rob the cash register. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's, that's actually, so, that happened in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody tried to do that. I robbed the bar <laughs> that I worked at as a bouncer twice. Came nice. through the back door with a mask on and a gun. You know? <laughs> you worked there. And I worked there. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. It's horrible. Moment. Yeah, our our place there were guys to watch that. They had two huge bouncers, you know, watching the money all the time. Yeah, I'm sure you saw some major brawls in there too, huh? Yes, the ridiculous brawls. There was this one guy, he was a major drug player in Colombian. He and his boys would come into the bar, pick out one guy every night, yeah. and they would pick on him until he went outside and got in a skirmish with them. And he would beat the out of him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and that happened every time he came in. Plus, you're a handsome guy, so I'm pretty sure being the bartender at a popular nightclub was advantageous. I 
did well. <laughs> I can't deny it. One way of putting it. I was always looking for that right girl, though. But it's you know they're not in the bars. Not usually. Yeah, that's, no. that's exactly not usually. It. It's pretty rare. They're more the right now girls, not the right girls. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right now tonight. <laughs> tonight. Girl. Yep. So let's get to your book. It's a fiction novel, but also that incorporates a lot of your real life happenstances and things right. to So like your main character, is your main character loosely based on you or inspired by you or somebody you... It is. It's me. I call it my autobiography because it's yeah. a lot of it's based on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like to say it's 90% half true. So are you Sean in the book? Yeah. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell them. <laughs> what inspired you to write the book? Book. I know you saw all kinds of crazy stuff when you were working, but I mean, you were formulating this story in your mind. Yeah, I was starting to chronicle it like a few years in. And I started accumulating them. But I was kind of embarrassed to share this with my family and my friends and almost afraid that the people I used to work with or these people in the book yeah. would not approve of me putting it out there. So I sat on it for a long time. Probably like, who cares? Yeah, I know. Well, there's some heavy duty players that were involved with this particular club. I think they're most of them are dead by now. So tell us a little about the story. But I think some gangsters are involved. Take us through the story a little bit. Well, let me give you the little synopsis. It's 24 years previous. The owner, Bo Garrett, brawled with and then abandoned his best friend to die a needless death. A deceitful cover up that still haunts him to this day. Unbeknownst to the unscrupulous nightclub owner, the dead man's son, Sean Collins, is his cabaret's best bartender, hell-bent on revenge. Can Sean uncover the truth and bring down Bo before his own demise? So is this guy like a gangster? Is he a bad guy? He yeah, he had mob ties. Mob ties. And I could tell by the guys that he had hanging around the club all the time and the bagmen that were picking things up and keeping an eye on the club. And You know, a lot of the L.A. faction of the mafia, or Costa Nostra, were kind of misfits. There were guys that like were persona non grata. They didn't want to kill him, so they sent him out to L.A. to. to yeah, they just sent him. <laughs> yeah, L.A. was like the Wild West. You came from Detroit, a lot of Chicago influence. Chicago, but, Cleveland. But nobody owned it. That was the thing. And you could go there yeah. and just anything goes. Yeah, you don't hear too much of it in the Bay Area, like Northern California. I mean, I don't know how it works there, but it seems kind of unusual. Yeah, there was probably only a handful of guys. I think the muscle was in SoCal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So anyways, the plot for this story, where did that come well, from? Well, uh, like it's a lot of it's based on the stories that I accumulated. And then I incorporated that into this fictional story. And it's got a lot of rich characters that I pulled from real life. I mean, I know a lot of the people you were writing about. And then I just developed a fictional story to coincide with it. Yeah, there's a lot there to work with. Oh, yeah, for sure. And all the characters that come into the bars. I mean, there's just hundreds of personalities and situations. and Yeah, guys like Bill or me. <laughs> I yeah, don't even know. Do kids even go out anymore? They don't even seem to want to leave the house. Do people still go out to bars? I don't. Not like they used. To, we had no. to earn our way with women. We had to go to clubs and meet them and woo them. <laughs> we actually had to be charming. We couldn't order them like pizza. There's no internet. There is no phones. No sexting. You know. Yeah. No dating apps. No. No, no none Instagram. Of that stuff. But a lot of those clubs are closed down, man. Because like you said, man, these kids today they want to sit in a basement and play no, video games. Exactly. <laughs> So the stuff that you saw, so you weaved it together into form of, you know, this fictional novel yep. with these colorful, interesting characters. Yep. What is the main plot of it? He's trying to discover what really happened to his father. He gets this letter. Um, his mother thinks that Bo, the owner of the club, was involved with killing him but years before he was born. So he gets this letter and then he says, you know, I got to find out what the hell happened. See, he takes this job at the club and hoping to find out what happened and get close to Bo and figure out if he really did it and get his revenge for it. So he buddies up to the owner. Right. Who's the owner's business partner was Sean's father. They were in business right before Sean was born. And then Sean's father had an accident, a boating accident. And his mother always suspects that it was Bo, the club owner. Well, it was actually because an insurance payout. He just wanted the full club to himself. They didn't have the club yet. It was kind of a love triangle situation with Sean's mother. Well, that's smart. That's smart. I like that. They were all in partnership together in that adventure they had. Is that based on real life? Uh, no. <laughs> that part's not. No, that didn't happen. No, good. I was like, I was like, 
ah, this guy's dirtier than I thought. You know, he was a real that. bastard, though. Let yeah. me say that. The club owner. Uh, he was a piece of work. So this douchebag, and we don't want to give away the, no, the, no. the ending of the story, but so he's cozying up to this freaking guy right. at the club, almost like a double agent. You know, you're... you're That's accurate. You're trying to penetrate this guy, tease some information. On, but the bad guy, he knows who Sean is, right? He's aware of his father and all that, no. right? He doesn't know. Oh, oh, good. Yeah. yeah. No, he doesn't yeah. know that's him. So does he use like a fake name or something? Or? Well, he was adopted. So he has a totally different name and mother. And well, this dude has no idea. He doesn't, that, he doesn't that see it dude. coming. Well, let me ask you this. Is Sean getting sucked in, though, where he kind of like wants to be there? And kind of wants to let go of the mission? That's what happens, yes. He gets sucked into the bar life, and he gets distracted by all the partying and the women and the drinking and the drugs. And there you go. So, yes, he gets totally involved in the, that end of it, and it kind of takes him out of reaching his goal. That's what would happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a lot of fun getting there. Yeah. He, he might just end up like, man, screw it. I, uh, this is too much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, things, things happen. happen. Right. Well, that's kind of what you find out when you get in the middle of it. You know, it's just, it is. Now, was there a lot of cocaine involved? There was. <laughs> <laughs> there was. Just a lucky rent. guess, Gunner. Yeah. Lucky, lucky guess. guess. Well, it was that era, you know. It was still pretty good, too. It wasn't all trampled on. Yeah. Cocaine <laughs> was quite the party favor back then. It was funny because I was super anti-drugs back then. Then ultimately, I would get addicted to pain pills and start using heroin. So it's like, oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> now you're in the major league. Yeah. So it's funny. I was <laughs> okay. so anti drugs and anti coke, but, you know, the pain pills were addicting. And, and, and it's a gateway drug. Now I'm the freaking loser that I used to like make fun of or not want to be here. Oh, and, yeah. And I was a horrible drug addict too because I would just lose my mind. I go robbing and stealing everything. I got rob everybody in my freaking path. Yeah. Bro. He was robbing his own friends. <laughs> Good thing we didn't know him then. <laughs> <laughs> but there are so many people who couldn't even function in that high stress arena without having to be on coke yeah. all night they had yeah. to i mean it was so busy they just couldn't handle the stress and you know juggling 20 orders at a time and helping a club full of people and you know keeping it all yeah. together it's it's a difficult task for most people cocaine really works by the way cocaine is an incredible stimulant mm -hmm. and it enhances what you can do and i remember one time i went played a video game the farthest stage i'd ever gotten to was like 23 right, right? This particular night, I got some cocaine. Oh, no. And, dude, I got the stage like 49, bro. Yeah, I had a crowd of people <laughs> watching me. I'm sweating. If this is the best endorsement we have for cocaine, it's not good. Yeah. I'm sitting there sweating, bro. Improve your scores. We had a guy who worked in one of the places. He'd bring bars wrapped in Colombian newspaper, like bricks, and he'd just shave it off and give it to everybody in the bar. It's crazy. Let me ask you this. Yep. Book or no book, what is one of the most remarkable stories that you remember from your time as a bartender? Oh, well, you know, I actually had a jealous husband call me while I was in my living room with a girl that I got from the bar calling me saying how I ruined his life and I, he couldn't believe I was sleeping with his wife. I had no idea. She told me she was single, obviously. Yeah. And I talked him down. And it was literally because he was on a roof across the street with a freaking rifle. What? On the neighbor's house across the street, looking down into my bay window in my living room. Where we were sniper, sitting. Bill. Yes. Wow. But I talked to him and I go, dude, I had no idea. I'm so sorry. I will not see her. I sent her home and I come to find out the guy was on the freaking roof ready to he look down. There's like a laser dot sitting up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah that's she funny. was amazing too. I was like, ah, that but you, you don't know. That's the thing. You, they lie to you. Don't present themselves honestly. And you, that's could happen to you. Yeah. Is that in the book? That is in part two, which will be coming out next summer. All the reviews are like five star and everybody says it's fast paced. It's very engaging. Every uh, review says I was gripped. Yeah, I love that. And just binged it. Breaking Bad meets um... Bartender. <laughs> <laughs> like a famous nightclub. You know, I think of Miami or one of those you know famous nightclubs. Oh, like what was the max capacity at the club you worked? It at? was 800 and we pushed that all the time. The fire marshal was yeah. there. The clubs I used to go to were more like state theater or whatever, but they were kind of like dumb. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, mine was nasty. No, this was beautiful. It was well-maintained, nice and crystal polished. I mean, it was clean. And the time that I worked there was four to one women, which is a huge wow. freaking draw. I mean, that's very unusual. And yeah. they felt safe because we kept them safe. Well, man, it's 
Sum up the book. Tease it. Tell people why they want to read this book. Well, it's filled with lots of interesting characters and adult situations. And you can experience the decadence that I did through my yeah. eyes as an insider and without guilt, hangovers, or peril. Or cope. Yeah. I think this is perfect for the younger generations. I think so, too. It's a good time. Your book is kind of a throwback yeah. to a bygone era. I know. It's hard to believe. but yeah. Glamorous partying <laughs> and just, yeah. I wasn't real big into drugs and drinking, but I love to go out and hit on girls and go to parties and go do all this stuff. And, sure. And exactly. that's what you were doing. And Well, I figured I was going to be in a bar anyway. I might as well be on the right side of the bar, controlling the action. Did you drink while you were working? <laughs> we did. We had codes for, I mean, we would make drinks for each other and slide them down the rail and water would be rumplements. We'd fill a glass yeah. with rumplements and ice and it looks like water or Sprite and Cokes were a Jägermeister. So we were drinking huge glasses of Jägermeister or rumplements all night. Would you get drunk? Eh, you know, you're so busy and you're so wired and moving and just going. It's it's hard to be. A couple of bumps of Eddie and you're, you're good to go. <laughs> you know, I always waited till after work. That's probably one wise thing that I did was not while I was at work. Did you call it Eddie? Uh, people called it Eddie, yeah. I thought that was a regional thing in Detroit. <laughs> Somebody yeah, might have brought it out. You know? Down south, they were called Scooby <laughs> Snacks. <laughs> that, <laughs> there's, hey, there's also a free companion book that I offered everyone. Yeah. And I sent you the link to that. It's a cocktail book and it also has items from the story that, that are part of the story. Oh, that's cool. I like it. And that's free to everybody. They could sign up and they get the free book. They can get that at your website? Yeah, yeah. Author AJAnthony.com. So AJ, you sent us an audio clip from the book. Let's have a listen to a little clip. Yeah, and hang on. I'll throw in the mixing board here. I'll do some music and sound effects. Sure. Sean felt numbness in his arms and an intense chill throughout his body. Looking up, he saw that his hands were roped together and he was dangling from a hook like a fresh beef carcass. He turned his head to the right, causing him to rotate slightly. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see another figure hanging next to him. He contorted his body to get a better look. It was Crystal. She was severely beaten and bloody. Her face was almost unrecognizable. Examining her further, he could see her chest was deflated, no longer housing massive implants. They had been cut out. Above that carnage, no moss was crudely carved into her chest, arcing over the gruesome handiwork. Sean's stomach churned. Oh, shit, it's payday. Koki enters the walk-in freezer wearing a butcher apron and wielding a chainsaw. Bueno, you're awake. I want you to see this. Koki pulls on the saw starter cord once, twice, three times, and it fires up. The familiar, now horrifying buzz of the saw fills Sean's ears. Gas exhaust clouds the room. The roar alerts Crystal. Her head bobs up and her eyes agape. She wiggles but is dangling helplessly. Koki steps up to her and revs up the saw. Lo siento, hermosa. Boss's orders. I will make it quick for you. No, Koki, it's my fault, Sean pleads. Sean's cry falls on deaf ears. As Koki revs up the saw again, Crystal releases a blood-curdling scream. Sean cannot look and closes his eyes. Koki places the sharp rotating chain between Crystal's legs, shreds up through her crotch and under her right armpit. This slices her in two, splattering warm plasma all over Koki's face. The human rack of lamb falls to the ground in a heap. Her remains are still hanging and rotating. Crystal is now half the woman she used to be. She is now silent, but Koki isn't finished. He licks the blood from his lips and levels the blade, gritting his teeth. Wow. So that wasn't exactly what I was yeah, thinking. Yeah, that took a pretty hard left. Ho, 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 Merry Christmas. <laughs> pretty you know, dark. From my bar experience, I can say waking up next to a severed hooker or whatever that was, that, that almost never happened. <laughs> yeah, almost. I mean, the word that comes to mind is macabre but also reminiscent of the cartel in Mexico. Yeah, and God help me, I still want to read this, if not even more. You're a sick man. You're a sick, sick man. Thank you. I, I know it's going to be uh, one of those books that Bill's really going to enjoy. Well, I can't wait to read it. I think it's going to be amazing. Well, that was beautifully written. <laughs> so the book's available on Amazon, I'm assuming. It is. In all formats, it's in audiobook, it's in ebook, hardcover, paperback. It's also available in Spanish. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So where can they find you? Because you're an interesting dude, and, and I, I feel like people should follow you. 
I like that. I'm in the, all the social media. I'm, it's author AJ Anthony. Everything's under author AJ Anthony. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. TikTok, Facebook, Twitter. And you used a pen name because you didn't want to, like the the shame your family and friends. I did. I, <laughs> yeah. That's what took me so long to put it out there. I'm going, God, I don't really want my mom and my sister. Right. To- <laughs> yeah, like no so much even though they probably suspected <laughs> plus all the people who came in the bar and worked in the bar the names have been changed to protect the guilty right exactly not, not <laughs> the innocent trust me no not, the guilty. Not a lot of <laughs> they were all guilty everybody's guilty in this book man <laughs> yeah i was partying but it was good talking to you john yeah thanks, in touch. i'm gonna listen to your book i'm gonna download it you do it enjoy that yeah <laughs> i'm sure i'll be into it i appreciate it bill i think we have to take a quick break and then when we come back we'll have on our next guests stay tuned on 1010 The King, it's our thing. Do you own a timeshare? Well, face the facts. You made a mistake. You made a bad purchase. A timeshare is not an investment. It's a money pit that continues forever. If you use your timeshare, that's great. But if you don't and you want to legally get out of your contract, call my friends right now at the Timeshare Exit Hotline. They're an experienced team of lawyers who help good people like you get out of a timeshare contract that they just don't want. Don't throw away your money on maintenance fees. Use it for things you really want. We can help you end your timeshare contract and stop the money drain immediately. If you are ready to move on with your timeshare, call our team right now. Cancel your timeshare now with a free call. 800-852-1736. 800-852-1736. 800-852-1736. That's 800-852-1736. How would you like to get a free $100 prepaid MasterCard and save money on your television bill? Then call right now. Make the switch to Dish TV. For a limited time, we're offering a two-year price guarantee. That's important for those of you on a fixed budget to know your prices won't go up for two years. Plus, you have hundreds of channels, lots of live news and sports, movies, and more. And when you call right now, you can also ask about our discounts for seniors and those of you in the military. So, make the switch to Dish right now. Call right now, ask about our senior discount, our military discount, and your free $100 prepaid MasterCard. 800-795-5573. 800-795-5573. Paid for by NPS. Switch to Dish TV today for your free prepaid MasterCard. What's up? Welcome back to our thing on 1010 The King. And now I'd like to welcome to the show a very special guest. I like to think she's a friend, Sandra Petty. Let me preface this with just saying that she's a very remarkable journalist. Pulitzer Prize winner. How many people can say that in their life? Author of a book about Sonny Francis, The Last of the Old Time Mafia Bosses, John Sonny Francis. This is a really amazing book, very popular. And I actually helped her market it and promote it. But uh, welcome to the show, Sandy. Sandra. Thank you so much. Either one. Either one is fine. As long as you call me, I don't care what you call me. I typically (laughs) like to keep it personal, Sandy. So we'll call it Sandy. And Sandy is a fan of mine. Uh, She read both my books. I I said, would you read my books if I send them to you? And she said, I absolutely will. Now, a lot of people say that, and I wasn't sure she would, you know, because she's kind of a big shot. But then she did. And this is a true story. One day... A couple months later, I get a phone call. I see it's her. I answer the phone. First thing out of their mouth is like, I just finished volume two. She's like, where do I post my rave reviews? I said, Amazon would be great, you know? And then the next words out of her mouth are etched into my memory because she said, she said, how can they not make this a movie? That was your exact words. Like, how can they not make this a movie? And I said, yeah, you know, I agree. We just got to get it into the hands. But anyways, I want to talk about your book and Sonny Francis. Now, people who don't know Sonny Francis, he literally was the last of like the old time mafia boss. This guy's got a really remarkable story. In fact, the movie should be made about this guy's life. He spent like 50 years in prison and got out as an old man like you know i think he was 100 when he got out and so he was not somebody you could get close to but eventually he was able to be able to interview him yeah friend of his frankie blue eyes made the introduction he asked him he said would you be okay with this and sunny said okay and sunny was ready when i met sunny he was 101 years old living in a nursing home in queens because no one in his family was willing or able to take him home 
And so it was, he knew it, he knew he didn't have much time left to live, although he lived another couple of years and he wanted to tell his story. Well, well to be fair, caring for a 101 year old man, there's not many people who are, you know, equipped to, to that. that kind of care. Yeah. This guy is one of the most remarkable people uh, that it's ever lived. I'm telling you, this guy just says story after story after story in this book, buy her book, read this book. I mean, this guy was like a old school, true mafia Don boss gangster through and through before we get into that i want to just ask you like what made you sandy decide to write this book you know and dive into this big project because i fell in love with the story it was such a remarkable story i've done a lot of stories over the course of my career but i've never run across one like sunny he really was a remarkable guy and my wellesley book club they read the book and they said did you like sunny and i said Yeah, I did. And I'm not supposed to like a guy who was a killer and a ruthless mobster, but I did. He was smart, funny, and at age 101, he was completely lucid. He was a really, really sharp guy. Great storyteller. He was likable. Yeah, I've never heard anyone say otherwise. Yeah, I mean, you know, life is crazy. When I was young, I was a gangster, and I was a criminal, and I was a bad guy. But I still was charming and witty and funny, and people (laughs) liked me who got to know me. And, you know, and plus I was able to change down the road. And I think Sonny Francis was one of those guys who never really had a chance. Like, he was brought into that world. That world became the only world he knew. He took it very serious. When he got up in the morning and put his shoes on, he was a mobster putting his shoes on, and he knew it. And everything he did throughout that day wrote all the wrong coastals, everything. That's so true. This was like an old school guy. He lived coastal. I knew guys like that. I knew guys like that in my family. These are guys who everything they do while they're driving, their mind is thinking about coastal. That, that's it and they, they took great pride in it but this guy so how many years of prison did he actually do altogether? he did about 28 because in the federal system you never do the whole bid he was sentenced to 50 years but he kept on getting paroled and then he would violate parole and get sent back to prison he violated his parole five times and he violated his parole just because he associated with other guys like him That's all it was. And so he'd get sent back. And then when he was, I think, 89, his own son, his favorite son, testified against him in a trial and he was sent back for another eight years that must have broke his heart could you imagine you know it's it's funny because i asked him about john who was his youngest son and his favorite son and the most like him and he said i don't know i must have been the drugs because john for many years was a desperate drug addict and john went into witness protection which was a program that was created because of sunny francis that program didn't exist before Sonny Francis. And so who knew that years later it would come back to haunt him when his own son went into that program. Well, years later, John sneaked into New York to visit his father at the nursing home in Queens where he lived. And his father said to him, why did you do what you did? And he said, dad, I wasn't testifying against you. I was testifying against the life. Well, yeah, but that didn't do Sonny any good because it sent Sonny to prison. Uh, Sonny is the life. Yeah, it's the same thing. Well, exactly. And Sonny said, well, you're my son and I love you, but you've always been crazy. So in the end, Sonny forgave his son for that incredible betrayal. You know, Michael Francis, anyone who doesn't know that, Michael Francis is yes. a very charming and charismatic guy, a big YouTube show, and he's a speaker and very likable. That's his other son. And I have had conversation with him about his father, you know, and he's like, me and my dad are in good terms. And, and in fact, I actually was trying to set you up in the meeting with him. And I don't know if that ever happened. I know that, you know, his dad, for you know, kind of forgave him, too. True, he did. It's worth mentioning, though, Sandra, the, the longstanding rumor I've always heard is that Sonny had put a hit out on both John and Michael during this time. That's yeah. actually true. That's true. And Michael absolutely believes it's true. And John doesn't necessarily believe it's true. But it came out in court testimony that Sonny authorized a hit on John and Michael. I believe but, it because Ori Spada was wrapped up in this stuff too, and there was a hit on Ori. Well, that's true. Really? I didn't that's know that. true. Ori is more, yes, he's wrapped up in it, but he's not quite as important in the Francis family as he thought he was. Yeah. But he did help John out of some situations when John was messed up on, on cocaine. Right. But 
Tell us a couple of stories, like the ones that stand out in your mind about Sonny. Tell us a little about him. You, I know he's got a couple of great stories, and I know uh, him and Sinatra had a, a bit of a situation. You know, one day I said to him, I said, so Sonny, did you know Frank Sinatra? And he looked at me and he said, you asked the question the wrong way. The question should have been, did Frank Sinatra know Sonny Francis? And he talked yeah. about how, you know, he would hang out at the Copacabana, which was, of course, the club where all the mobsters went because um, Frank Costello was a silent partner. And he talked about how Sinatra would call out to him and try to get him to turn around. He'd say, hey, Sonny, Sonny. And Sonny wouldn't turn around. He wouldn't acknowledge him just to drive him nuts. And his friends would say, yeah. you know, why do you let him get away with calling you? And he said, well, but he's a great singer. Singer, you made him that. And then the other story Sonny told about Frank Sinatra was, well, Frank was on stage at the Copa performing. Ava Gardner was in the audience watching him. And Sonny decided to hit on Ava Gardner and pulled her in the back room and was making out with her. He didn't get beyond some passionate kisses and feeling and all of that sort of thing. Uh, and she's one of the few women he didn't claim to have slept with. But he did that just to get at Frank Sinatra. Yeah, it's funny, man. That's funny. Did he speak Sicilian as his first language? Uh, did he have an accent? Like, no, I, I... He, well, he had a Brooklyn accent, but no, no. You know, and I grew up in Minnesota, so for a Brooklyn accent is still very distinctive. So, no, oh. he did not have an accent. And by the way, when he was 101, one of the days I was talking to him, my videographer, who's a guy, walked away for a minute. And his son, he turned to me and he said, say, are you married? I said, yes, honey, I'm married. He said, Dad, <laughs> Too bad. I'll take you out to lunch when I get out of here. <laughs> so here he was. 101 flirting with me. That's classic. But that was Sonny. He was a very, very charming guy. And you know what? If I could have gone out to lunch with him, I absolutely would have. Oh, absolutely. He had a presence. When he walked in the room, there's a story about, I think it might have been John Gotti, said, Sonny walked into the room. And then when he walked out, he said to the people with him, he's like, now that's a real gangster right there. You know, so when somebody like John Gotti is saying, hey, listen, that guy's a gangster. You know, this guy's serious, serious business. And it seemed like everybody who met Sonny Franzese had that reaction to him. Well, absolutely. And, you know, I've interviewed a lot of cops and gangsters over the years. And, you know, cops generally don't like gangsters. They don't respect them. They view them as bad guys. And by the way, they are bad guys. And, and that's perfectly appropriate. The thing that was striking for me when I was first calling around about Sonny was it wasn't just street guys who respected Sonny. People in law enforcement respected him because he was tough and he always held himself in a very gentlemanly way when he was arrested. He didn't make a fuss. Yeah. He always looked beautiful. He, you know, he had custom made suits. I remember this one FBI agent, Bernie Welsh, telling me that he came to court in an orange jumpsuit and he looks like a million bucks in an orange jail jumpsuit. Yeah. And he acted like a gentleman. He was just very smooth and very polite, really, to everyone. That's a true mafioso. And, you know, Sonny was used to it. But, I mean, he was a likable, charming, kind of charismatic guy with just happened to have the good looks. Also, was he a boxer, too? Oh, yes. He, you know, when he was a young man, he boxed a lot. And he told me a lot of stories about his boxing matches. And, of course, he won every one of his boxing oh, yeah. matches. In every one of his stories, he got the girl. He won the fight. He got the better of the end of the deal yeah. but he told it in such a self-deprecating way it was really very very appealing so yes and he was a natural athlete and you could tell it even you know when i met him he was in a wheelchair but you could tell just by the way he held himself that you know he had a certain inner strength and he had this zest for life that's the thing that's so amazing here he was when i met him at 101 i think he was still on probation and so a patient officer had to come to the nursing home to check on him when he was in a wheelchair and had all sorts of physical problems. And, he, you know, he was pretty amused by the whole thing. But he was just so thrilled to be out of prison and to be free, if you will, and just had this great zest for telling stories and looking back on his life. What a legend, Bill. That guy's a legend. Again, I don't try to aggrandize bad guys or even my own life. The bad guy part, I'm 
ashamed of and embarrassed by. But, you know, I was one of those guys, too, like Kim. I, I usually won the fight. I usually got the girl. I, I usually got made the score or whatever. But he was the next level. And so you got to respect a guy like that. You know what I'm saying? And oh, absolutely. But on the darker side, he's famous for his portrayal of how to dispose of a body. Oh. Well, that. yes. You know, John, his youngest son, told me a story about how he was walking through one of their auto body shops. He saw there was some kind of acid pool or acid bath that they used for cleaning the tools. He said, oh, that's good. That's good. Good for dissolving bodies. And one time they were driving along the Brooklyn Queens Expressway and John was driving. And he said, I did a piece of work over there. And John said, what? He said, I did some work. And John said, what? And he said, oh, I got to explain everything to you. This is why you will never be like me. Because, you know, of course, in that life, a piece yeah. of work we'll kill is a somebody. killing. So he was proud. He was proud of what he did. But I can tell you, he never, ever spoke about that with me because, of course, he knew there's no statute of limitations right. on murder. Right. Right. The other thing he never, ever spoke about was how much money he made because he was terrified of the Internal Revenue Service. He was more afraid of the IRS than he was of the U.S. Attorney's Office. Yeah, because yeah. at 101, you don't want to get life sentence. That would be a, that'd be a death sentence, you know. Yeah. But yeah, he talked about my microwaving bones? Well, yes. He talked about putting bones in the microwave to clean them before, so you could get rid of them. And, you know, I talked about this with his family members because I interviewed 130 people. And one relative said he didn't even know how to turn on a microwave. And John said, yeah, but he certainly knew how to tell someone else to do it. How yeah. to turn on the microwave. Yeah, yeah. It's funny, man, the dichotomy. And he had, you know, the opportunities. A guy like Sonny Francis could have been running a Fortune 500 company. He could have been a governor uh, or a senator. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question about that. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of guys, since I wrote the book, and understand, I'm not a mob expert. I grew up in Minnesota. I didn't even know the mob existed until I saw The Godfather. So I'm hardly an expert. But since I wrote the book, a lot of guys, I would say half a dozen guys have approached me to tell their stories. And you know what? They're not sunny. Just yeah. being in that life doesn't make you charming. It doesn't make you interesting. It doesn't make you fun. Exactly. You know, there's just a very small portion of these guys who are really important. And Sonny's important because he really embodied the rise of the American mafia. And he also foreshadowed and its fall. fall with his prison sentence. They haven't gone away completely, but they're certainly much diminished from what they were 20 years ago. So when Sonny came into the mob, though, he wouldn't have been like Prohibition, right? He'd been after that. Right after so It's not yeah. like he was with yeah. Luciano, but he certainly was in that crowd later in life. Yeah. Well, he knew those guys. And, you know, Albert Anastasia, when he was courting his wife, Tina, Albert Anastasia came over to the dinner table to say hello to Sonny, which, of course, impressed Tina. He knew all the major players. He knew Vito Genovese. Right. But I'm just making the association. He was a little bit younger mm -hmm. than the guys we think of as the classic mobsters, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, people know, you know, growing up around the Detroit Mafia, when you walk into a restaurant or a place or anything, and there's a guy like Sonny Francis in the room, people show them a different kind of respect. That's true. They come over and grab their hands with both hands and they shake them. They give them a kiss on the cheek, you know. And of course, everybody around notices that. So I'm sure, especially Sonny, man, he probably grew up in that environment around the Lucky Lucianos and all these people. And he was a man of honor. He was a guy who, who took Costa Nostra serious and he made himself a legend. And sad how his life ended so much time in prison and his sons and all that stuff but ultimately r.i.p god bless him i hope he found christ and he's in, in heaven and at peace but he has got one interesting story man it's all in your book i hope they take your book and use it for materials to make a movie well i hope so it'd be a ready-made classic i mean it's a, you can't make this up you know well, that's just it. And and the sad, sad part about Sonny is he never rolled, and yet two of his sons did. It's sad that Sonny Francis wasn't able to kind of get out when he was younger, turn it around and live a normal, productive life. You know, I, I got to tell you, he wasn't sad about his life. He was sad about the damage it did to his family. But I think if he had it to do over, he would have done it the same way. 
Well, I mean, I'm saying with all those years in prison, that, that's, that's tough. Well, that is tough. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. But you're right. I get it. He's one of those guys who certainly would have been like, I'm still going to be a gangster no matter what. I'm proud of it. Yeah. And we'll, we'll never know what he could have done, but what he definitely did was Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Is that true? Yes, that, it is true. It is true. He boinked Marilyn Monroe? Absolutely. That, that's the most gangster thing he ever did. <laughs> and that was the one time he ever expressed shame to me you know he didn't want to tell me that story it took like a lot to get that out of him why he was protective of joe dimaggio joe dimaggio was his childhood hero and yeah, hero. you know he felt bad yeah. about violating joe dimaggio not marilyn monroe but joe dimaggio right you know? right Right. One of the most compelling stories I heard from Ori's take, who I know pretty well, he said one time he had a scam planned out to set up a fake audition and they were going to get these guys that wanted to be actors and they're going to try out and blah, blah, blah. But he needed to really make it look good. So he's going to get $50,000 from Sonny Francis. And he said, we had lunch and I explained the whole plan to him and stuff. He said, you think it'll work? And he goes, yeah, Ori, I think it'll work. But let me ask you this. Do you think that's the right thing to do? And he's like, what? He goes, making all this money off these kids with a dream? I mean, is that the best you can do? Or do you think that's right? Tell you what, if you want $50,000, he goes, go to a loan shark, tell him you need to borrow $50,000. And when he wants the money back, tell him that it was for me. And that's what he did. Uh, you <laughs> and he's pay. like, yeah, he never had to pay it back. Yeah. He's like, there, you no, just made your funny. money. That's a great story because Sonny was very cheap. You know, he never spent money. But but you raise a really good point because Sonny was really protective of young kids. He really didn't want kids, young kids to be beaten up or abused. And he had this interesting sense of honor about him. And you know, unlike a lot of other high ranking mobsters, his men were fiercely loyal to him because he was good to them. And that's important. Yeah. So he did have his own sense of honor. And, you know, he killed people. I mean, we should say he killed a lot of people and he liked killing. But he once said to me, he said, I didn't kill any innocent people. So I <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, you know, soldiers kill people. We've had this conversation a hundred times. But yeah, but right. by the soldiers way, who made you people. God? Who who decided when since when do you get to decide who's innocent well, or guilty? You know, so that's the sociopathic mindset in that world. It's all part of uh, grooming when he was young, the people he was around. And I used to beat up guys who owed money at five hundred dollars. I had to knock them out and stuff. It's a horrible thing to do. You know, punch a guy in the face and beat him up for a couple hundred dollars. Like, who am I? Right. But on the flip side, when it comes to monsters and hits, you're in the game and everybody knows the rules. Well, that's true. So you that's play true. by the rules. That's very, very true. They weren't innocent. They weren't innocent. They weren't innocent. I would just encourage people to read the book. And the story is pretty incredible. And I think Sonny told his own story very, very well. There's a lot yeah. of Sonny's voice in there. And I think his voice is pretty unique. He was a unique character, and I don't encourage anyone to go live that life, be involved in that life. So it's hard for me to say this, but if you're going to be in that life, you want to kind of mirror yourself after someone like Sonny Francis, a man of honor. He will not cooperate. People around him respected him. People around him loved him. He was a family man. But if you're going to get involved in the mob, you might as well be all in and be like him. And nowadays, it's, it's not even like that. These young kids today, they get in, they think they're rappers, and they're posting on Instagram and stuff like that. And, you know, they get busted, face five years, 10 years in prison, and they cooperate, you know, and then they go move right back to the old neighborhood. Well, I was going to say, if you think you want to be in the culture of Sonny Francis, you probably missed your chance. Those days are gone. I, I think it's true. I think it's a very, very different time. And, yeah. you know, and by the way, I mean, these are not good guys. You know, they're basically... Mm -hmm. All they ever do is try to rip people off and hurt people for money. That's not good. And there's a terrible cost to the life. You make it sound so wrong. <laughs> Michael Francis is doing very well. But really, most of the mobsters I interviewed for this book are living in pretty reduced circumstances. You know, they're broke. They're living in bad neighborhoods. Correct. Usually that's the reason for the book. <laughs> well, I wish. You know, you don't make money on books either. So that's another moral yeah. of the story. That's crazy, man. This what a story. You guys, so everybody, Sandy, thanks for coming on. We appreciate you. Make sure everybody to check out The Last of the Old Time Mafia Bosses, John Sonny Francis by Sandra Petty, published by Penguin. I actually have two hardcover copies. And if somebody wants one of them, you send me an email and I'll send you one. They're not signed, though. 
But still, it's a beautiful book. You know, this is probably a $30, $40 book. So I want to give it to somebody who really wants to read it. So the book's available on Amazon and everywhere else books are consumed. Is the audio book available? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. And do you have a website or anything where people can find you? I do. If you look up S.J. Petty, because the book is by S.J. Petty, because the publisher was concerned that people wouldn't read a mob book by a woman. woman. So if you look up S.J. Petty, you can find my website. Well, thanks for coming on, Sandy. We appreciate you. I'd love to have you on for your next book. I've got a couple coming out, so we'll see. We'll see. I think you'll like them. Can you, can you we'll give see. us a hint what they are? Well, one is with the relative of a famous gangster. Uh, we just signed an agreement today. And then the next will have to do with some, perhaps a serial killer. All right, so, cool. Let's right. forward to it. When those books are ready to drop, let me know. We'll get you on the radio. So thank you both. This was a lot of fun. Enjoy the heck out of it. Thanks, sir. You're always fun. So everybody, I guess that's another episode of Our Thing on 1010 The King. God bless everybody. Have a great week. We'll see you next Friday. We out.